I'm Denise. She's a non-fiction editor. And I'm Louise. She's a fiction editor. And together, we're the Editing Podcast. Hello, and welcome to this episode of the Editing Podcast. So today, we're delighted to welcome thriller writer Andy Maslin. Andy is the creator of Gabriel Wolf, Stella Cole, and more recently, Inspector Ford. Welcome, Andy. We've been connected on Twitter for a while, so it's lovely to meet you finally face to face or voice to voice. Yeah, thank you for having me. Lovely to be here. Yeah, it's (laughs) lovely to have you. So where are we talking to you from today? I am in Salisbury, which is the, uh, we've moved here 17 years ago. So I sort of feel this is my adoptive hometown. You know, I've lived here mm-hmm. almost as long as I lived, uh, you know, in the town I was, sort of grew up in. But uh, this is what, this is, feels like home to me. Oh, Where was that you grew up in then? I grew up in Hemel Hempstead, which... Oh, uh, right. oh we know I, Hemel Hempstead, I, don't yeah, we? Yeah. There we are. New town on the north side of uh, oh. London. Yeah. We're, um, I'm, I'm originally from Bucket, um near High Wycombe in Buckinghamshire. Uh, okay, so yeah, yeah. Not yeah. far from you, and yeah. Denise worked in Maidenhead for many, many years. Oh, yeah, okay. yeah. All from that neck of the woods. Yes, but I'm back in the north, near the wall now, practically, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Winter is coming, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right, Andy, so before we dig into writing craft, uh, why don't you tell us a little bit of about your life before thriller writing and how your storytelling telling journey began? Sure, I can do that. I mean, I am 58 now, and my first piece of creative writing that I have a record of was when I was six years old. Um, wow. And my <laughs> uncle John, who is also a writer and guitarist like me, um, I remember we were up in Nottingham at his house, and I d- half wrote and then mainly dictated this story about a monster on this strange planet. And it's on a very sort of yellowed piece of paper where the, the sellotape has sort of, you know, gone crackly and fallen off. And this pink shiny paper stuck on, and that was this sort of shark monster. And oh. uh, he said to me, you can have it back when you're 15. Now, I mean, I'm six at the time, so this is mm. an eternity. And I used yeah. to ask him every time we went up to Nottingham, he said, yeah, when you're, when you're 15. <laughs> and eventually I forgot, when I was 15, he gave it back to me and I still have it in my kind of cabinet. Oh, that's of so oh isn't that lovely? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So when people say, how long you've been a writer? I say, currently 52 years. Um, <laughs> so it's kind of been in my blood. You know, my grandfather was a sort of self-educated, you know, classic working class autodidact. He was a butcher by trade, left school at probably 13 or 14. But he always had a dictionary in the house. He used to do crosswords and write to the papers Uh under a a pen name. He used to call himself Vox Populi. Uh, You'll remember him saying that in his sort of broad Nottinghamshire accent. Um, My dad's a published poet. So, you know, it's in my blood. And after yeah. university, I started working in marketing uh, and gravitated to the copywriting side of things and spent the next quarter of a century doing that, uh, set up my own business with my other half. Wrote lots of short stories. Um, but then, you know, actually children came along and, and all my creativity basically stopped, you know. It does that. Yeah. It, does it that. has that tendency, <laughs> doesn't it? And uh, anyway, the, the boys are sort of older now. And a, a, it was sort of five, six years ago, I was on holiday with my uh, wife and she said to me, you know, the difference between us, Maz, is you're a writer who does marketing for a living and I'm a marketeer who does writing for a living. And it was one of those kind of light bulb moments and a a real epiphany and I almost felt it physically oh my god you're absolutely right came home sat on the sofa and and with a sort of pencil and a notebook out splurged about 10,000 words in longhand of a story which became the first Gabriel Wolf book as if it had been dammed up all this time yeah yeah Mm -hmm. and it just poured out of me and, and after I thought my god I think I can actually write a novel because you know the longest piece I'd written before that was probably about 5,000 words for a short story switched to a computer and I have been writing ever since you know I've been full-time now for the last two years I started making enough money to give up the day job and uh, so when that's f- fascinating Andy so when you sat down you had that light bulb moment is was that something that had been sort of formulating in the back of your head for for years and this was now the opportunity for you to write it down or did it seem to spring from nowhere that particular story well I, a bit of both I mean the, mm-hmm. the the I 
often um, novels come to me with a kind of visual image. And I had this image um, of soldiers jumping off um, jumping off a cliff, not not downwards, but across to a sort of column of rock, you know, so, so like a, I think they call them sea stacks. Yep. And it, it I, I have a sort of memory of it. And in fact, a friend of mine who was at the time a colonel uh, in the army, well, still is a colonel actually, when we were staying with them on base, he said, oh, I know that. And he, he had it on videos and it was um, a, a documentary about SAS training. Right. And I had just slightly made it more dramatic but that was a sort of the spark that had just been buried somewhere deep um and kind of when i i mean i can't exactly remember what happened but obviously i sort of sat and i'm going to write a story about this ex-army guy and that was just the the sort of the sentence that came into my head about these six men standing on a cliff in the sort of freezing cold wind blowing off the North Sea or whatever, with armed men standing behind them. And the idea was, you thought, who are these? Are they just going to be, you know, forced to jump off or shot dead or whatever? And it turns out it's training. Um, right. Yeah. You, that's it. The other thing that I've just noticed about that, Andy, is that this is a question we probably would have asked you if you hadn't already answered it, but you, 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 you don't have a military background. And no, no, no. I spent my, my background is entirely <laughs> cerebral and, and desk based. Yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, I was in the air training corps when I was sort of 16. Okay. So, <laughs> but that, that's, yeah. you know, no, no military background at all. So you've got three series, 12 books in Gabriel Wolf, I think, four yeah. in Stella Cole, and mm. one Shallow Ground, which is um, the first in the Inspector Ford series. That's right. Um, how important is it for your creative writing process to work in this series format com compared with creating say standalone novels and is that a commercial decision or a creative decision or a mixture of both it, it's a good question I, it's, it's difficult to answer i'll try and unpack it because it, uh, you know initially i didn't realize i was writing anything for publication at all i just had this sort of real burning need to to tell this story and write this story and um then I sort of got into the sort of self-publishing business and I realized I wanted to write another one. And, you know, to be honest, it, I think initially it was, it was something I thought, well, I've got this character and I've got to know him a little bit. And I think there's, you know, there's more, more to be done. To, mm. There's more to be done here. And I, I was sort of reading lots of series. I mean, I, you know, I've come from a sort of, I guess you could call it a sort of highbrow literary sort of tastes in that, you know, for most of my adult life, I was sort of reading literary fiction, so-called, um, you know, um, Gabriel Garcia Marquez and okay. classics and, yeah. uh, you know, Margaret Travel, I mean, or all sorts, or, yeah, but mm. definitely literary fiction. And then one day, I, this was another epiphany, I think I woke up and I thought, my God, these books are boring, nothing happens. <laughs> You know, it's you heard sort of, it here, listeners. You, heard you know, it here. The, the kind of uh, I'm like an anti literary snob. You know, I just thought yeah. the kind of books I was reading, it's usually a sort of un a middle aged university professor being a bit fed up with life. And I thought, Jesus, this is this is another one. And I, I stopped almost overnight and I bought all of the as it was then the, the Rebus books by Ian Rankin on yeah, my Kindle. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and I read them one after the other. It took me about 10 months and I just read them all. And I thought, Binged it. Ah, oh, <laughs> this is great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And and so so I think, you know, that informed me. And in my copywriting career too, and in my life generally, I realised that, you know, I am a storyteller by nature. Mm -hmm. yeah, and it's in my, it's in my blood. Um, and, and, and what really attracts me to to whether it's you know literary fiction or genre fiction is a really good story um and actually i find that creatively i find it incredibly liberating to work within a, a format because it means i don't have to worry about a lot of things like who am i writing about and what are their internal drivers you know i've established all that mm -hmm. so i can just throw another problem at them and you know i heap shit on their heads and then just see how they get out of it and i find that that for me is the best kind of creativity because I just get going and you know see what happens to this person I, I did write one standalone which was a sort of a, a modern retelling of, of Dracula both a oh. myth and the original book so I did it in a sort of epistolary style with shop receipts and emails mm -hmm. and blog posts yeah. and you know it, these days I would have included podcast transcripts mm. um, so I followed very much the original sort of style of it 
uh, I think we've sold about like 300 copies, so it's never going to be a sort of pension. Oh, make novel. that 301. See, Dracula's yeah, yeah. been my favourite of all time. <laughs> really? Oh, well, yeah. I'll be interested in what you think. And I, I'll Love have to, I'll have cool. to read that. I've just finished. Um, I was telling Louise the other week with another podcast guest we were talking to. Um, that I've just finished Dracul by Dacre Stoker, um, which is based on letters and things that oh. um, Bram Stoker left behind. Wow! And yeah. so it's about Bram Stoker's early life, and it's great. And, and I, I'll just read anything to do with Dracula. So, oh well, there we are. There we are. So I, I'm making a note of that as we speak. Do you, know? <laughs> I mean, you see, you talk about Dracula. See, for me, that's a very interesting thing that nowadays, it, it, with a sort of patina of time, you know, Dracula was seen as a sort of I don't know it's called a literary classic it's certainly a classic you know mm -hmm. and, it, and it's seen I think it is basically seen as sort of gothic fiction literary fiction mm -hmm. at the time it was on a par with Lee Child I should think yeah you know? yeah I mean yeah. you know yeah. it was they you know I mean novels were not taken seriously in the 18th century they were seen as you know with all due respect to, to your gender it was like women's reading and the, the mm -hmm. dominant literary form was the essay yeah so people like Hazlitt mm -hmm. you know novels were seen as utterly disposable things and you know Dickens yeah, everyone talks about publishing in installments and all the rest of it mm -hmm. um so I think you know and what's great about Dracula is it's a fantastic story mm -hmm. yeah yeah, once, yeah. Once absolutely yeah <laughs> it also <laughs> means it also <laughs> means that in a hundred years time you and harlan coben might be on we are gonna be there we're gonna be statues <laughs> yeah yeah required <laughs> reading absolutely <laughs> um andy so you actually i want to go back to something that you said there about you know the, having uh, that another light bulb mo moment when you read um the ian rankin stuff um was that before you started writing um, for yourself um, did was, that, do you think that contributed mm, to giving you sort yes. of permission to write it, that kind of thing yes I mean mm -hmm. as I said you know I've always written uh poetry so short form you know poetry mm -hmm. uh and and short fiction and I always thought you know I don't think I've got it in me to write a novel and then I think because I was thinking it would have to be one of these sort of Hampstead type books you know mm -hmm. And then, you know, I, I consumed, you know, as you said, Louise, you know, I binged on Rebus and, yeah. and then others too, you know, Henning Mankell and, and got into oh, sort of, yeah, fantastic. <laughs> you know, we talked for hours about Henning Mankell and Wallander, but I thought, ah, there's this kind of book. I think I could write this kind of thing. And in fact, I really love this kind of thing. Um, and, you know, I did start working through Lee Child's, uh, the, the Reach stories. And one of the things that motivated me was, you know, although I, I loved them and I got completely addicted to Reach, after about 10, I thought, this guy is just a Terminator. Um, you know, I mean, bullets <laughs> almost literally bounce <laughs> off yeah. of him. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. There's no, you know, his chest muscles are so thick that he gets <laughs> shot in the, in the, you know, the peck. And it just stops a bullet, which A, it doesn't. <laughs> and B, I just thought, well, there's, there's not a lot of, you know, tension here, if you like, because nobody ever thinks is he or isn't he, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, and, yeah. and so I thought, well, I, I'd, you know, for my sort of protagonist, I'd love to have somebody with these like top skills, but who maybe is a bit more vulnerable. Yeah. Maybe it's, mm -hmm. you know, not quite so obvious that he's going to wade into a group of 20 knife wielding maniacs and come out unscathed. Mm. Mick Heron's books are a bit like that. Uh, some of his, um, uh, oh, the Slough House series. I don't know if mm. you've read any no. of them, but um, some no. of his characters are like that. You know, they're top skills. They're MI5 or I think, I think it's five. I can't remember now. MI5 or MI6 agents. Yeah. <clears throat> and but there, there's a vulnerability there. You know, they don't they don't always make it, or you're not sure if they're going to make it. And that that it's a it is a different experience to reading something like um, a, a Reacher novel because you you. you that it, it takes on a sort of different, a sort of more realistic. Yeah, uh, I think for some people, realism. probably for some people, there'll be comfort in the knowledge that nothing's ever going to happen to Jack yeah. Reacher. You know, and so sometimes you want that, don't you? You want that, yeah. There's a security there that you can read a good story and you know at the end of it he's going to be okay. Yeah. But then in other times you do want that uncertainty, challenge. don't you? That yeah. challenge, yeah. I think you do, and I mean, obviously, if you're going for a series, the, one of the sort of challenges is. Uh, if you want, you know, because I, it is also a commercial thing, you know, you like, um, you don't want to kill off your hero. Um, mm. You know, mm -hmm. I can't remember, it's, you know, Sherlock Holmes, somebody dies on, you know, off the right and back falls, and then, oh, damn it, you know, I should have never done that. Yeah. Um, so I think there's a sense that, you know, in Michael Gabriel Wolf, you know, you know he's not going to die. Mm. 
Yeah. Mm-hmm. So either you you play tricks with the um, the reader. So there's one book I think um, first casualty, the fourth one, where it starts off in media res. You know, in the middle of a firefight, and the opening sentence is Britta, I'm hit, and he looks down and there's blood everywhere. So oh my god, you know, and it's a, it, it's actually in his leg, so he's going to be fine. Mm-hmm. So instead of, sort of killing him physically, I've tried all manner of ways to kill him psychologically so he he's he has ptsd from his time in the forces and i've basically yeah mentally tortured him with everything i could think of to to throw a curveball at him so although he's you know he's not going to die but his soul takes a battering in every single book um and it's whether he can keep himself together that's that's really interesting, um, Andy, and that feeds into uh, my next question. I think you partially answered it in a way, uh, is whether um, you have any tips or things that you've learned about developing a coherent series um, or any pitfalls to avoid. So you've obviously got this thread running through um, with his challenges of PTSD, um, and that's something that you can you can build on and, and work with through your series. But is, are there any other things that you've learned about um, planning a series of books? Um, yes, although I've sort of if I if I say sort of learn them, I've learned them by, now by looking down the wrong end of the telescope. Although working <laughs> with um, Thomas and Mercer, uh, it has been a slightly more um, the other way round, you know, the way it should mm-hmm. be done. I mean, mm-hmm. my, my life has always been about gut feel and, in, uh, you know, impulsiveness and instinct. And then you work with a, a traditional publisher at, and, you know, they want a bit more sort of thought evidencing before you sort of rush off. Mm-hmm. One of the things I, I'd say, one of the things I've learned about a good uh, character-based series is you need to think um, in sort of two or three books ahead and, and the way I sort of visualize it, if you imagine nine books as being nine sort of stepping stones, each of those books, each stepping stone has a little mini arc that goes from one side to the other. So beginning to the end, there has to be a story arc. You know, it starts here, yeah. ends there. The hero gets what he wants or doesn't and changes it in some way. Then I envisage it that across the first three, so in groups of three, there's an arc yeah. that goes over those three. So it might be um, Gabriel thinks that he was responsible for killing his brother and over the three books we learn the truth of that backstory mm-hmm. but then you're thinking well okay fine so that that takes us three books ahead so there's been three mini arcs and one sort of bigger one now what so then you have to start seeding in perhaps in book three or book x you know another arc that is coming maybe it's a romantic relationship that goes sideways maybe he's been betrayed in an earlier part of his life and it's and that who is this character mm. um, which is where I am at the moment so the, the where I am in the moment the book I'm sort of halfway through there's a character from way back who now makes a reappearance and it's going to be the, the sort of culmination of a kind of vendetta if you like um, mm. mm-hmm. so and then you're thinking perhaps even about the whole let's just say you'd always plan to write a nine book series um, an arc that would go right across those full nine books. Now, if you, if you look at um, Wallander, try not to do any spoilers, but as you know, I mean, it's a fixed number of books. Wallander ages in real time like Reavers oh, does. Oh. And the story of him, his story, comes to a very particular ending. And that's that. And you feel incredibly satisfied. There's no sense of, oh, I wish you'd written another one. Mm-hmm. Yes. It's yeah. very it's natural. Like you've got closure, haven't you? Yeah. And it's You're the same happy. with the Martin Beck novels. Yeah, exactly. You get that closure. You feel... I finished, mm. you know, it's like people say I've done Netflix. You know, you can actually say I've done Wallander now. I can go on and reread if you want to. Mm. And do you feel though when you're writing, um, so you've got this sort of, you know, these various sort of arcs within arcs um yeah. in, in your head. Does that kind of is there ever a point where you feel like you 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 get excited about an idea and this sort of the, a bigger overarching arc do you have to kind of rein yourself in is what I'm getting at you know like is it is it sometimes ever a <laughs> Sorry, distraction because you're thinking three books ahead oh but you've god got to yeah concentrate on the the, the actual it novel is. arc the well, novel yeah arc. I mean I, you know so you probably sort of get a sense of this you know I'm sort of gut feel man I'm instinctive I'm broad brush I'm a pantser not a planner it's you know mm-hmm. it's a miracle that I actually dialed into this meeting today not tomorrow or <laughs> eight o'clock in the morning not eight o'clock in the evening you know I, I've always been completely hopeless with with those sorts of aspects of life so 
my head is always full of stories. You know, I walk the dog. We're fortunate. We have beautiful, beautiful countryside around us. And I, you know, I'm walking along, seeing body dumps everywhere, everywhere, basically, <laughs> and you know, horrors. And my brain is freewheeling. So you know, I'm recording stuff into my phone. So at the moment, I'm, I've got essentially five potentially six novels sort of all competing for headspace there's the yeah. one I'm drafting there's the one that's being edited there's the one that's just gone into cold read there's one I had to stop to write the one I was contracted to write there's the one that is with my first readers for Stella Cole there's other plots for other books and sometimes they say, oh my god that's good I really want to write that bit yeah yeah mm-hmm. you know oh you know and I think well I forget it so you know I've got notebooks all over the place and mm. a whiteboard and, and just ideas scribbled all over the place and <laughs> files on the computer called no story ideas yeah um so yeah I have to kind of discipline myself but you know again with Thomas and Mercer it's great he said you owe us this book on the 16th of November yeah huh, okay <laughs> right it. then yeah yeah, yeah. 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 Start writing. Like, yeah literally because I'd I, I done one and I've written two and I'd basically forgotten and I started this Gabriel Wolf book and Jack my editor who's now just moved to headline today said and you just thought we'd have a catch-up um so you know november 16th it was like first of october ah yeah no problem no problem at all leave it to me writing writing yeah Yeah, absolutely when i when i hear you um talking describing what's going on in your head there andy it, it to me um that that story of that that saying that you know everybody has a book in them and for some people that's where it should stay but everyone has a book in them <laughs> that just confirms to me that I don't have a book in me like that you know like I hear people like you talk about all these ideas and plans and it's like knowing where to go next and I think you must have all the books that those of us who don't have the books in our heads, <laughs> That's like stolen some of your they're books. all in yours <laughs> yes uh, I think I think you've somehow managed to pull them mm. all in because that sounds incredible well, yeah I've yeah, always, I, yeah I mean I, I, I try not to be false modest about it because it's not helpful I think I actually am this is what I was put on this planet to do honestly but you know it took me a long time to figure out you know what I was what my purpose was and in fact for the sort of five years before I was writing the novels you know I read lots of theology I read lots of philosophy I was reading books about string theory and quantum mechanics and trying to figure out you know something like you know the thing you, you can't see at the back of your head it was that sort of feeling mm. I was trying to get a hold of something and, and it turned out basically because this thing that Joe said to me you know it's what I was trying to get a hold of was that I should be writing novels you know yeah big big stories big ideas and as soon as I did it you know it, it was like as I say this sort of floodgates opened and I mean I've always written st- stories I've always found it very it's how I sort of communicate you know, when I'm teaching I do, used to sort of do a lot of teaching copywriting um, and I'm just a natural sort of raconteur, I guess. So mm-hmm. it's in my, and I come from a sort of very writery family. So I actually don't, I mean, a lot of those sort of creative writing course things, I, I think are rubbish, you know, like everyone's got a novel in them and write what you know. Mm-hmm. Write what you know, I think is the shittest piece of advice because <laughs> there'll be no science fiction for a start. There'll be yeah. no zombie uh, or yeah, horror. Yeah, there'll yeah, be no yeah. vampire novels. No you know, Mary Shelley would never... Do you know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. 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 I think it was somebody, I, I can't, was it um, Edith Wharton or somebody said, don't write what you know, write what you'd like to know. Mm. And I think oh, that's, yeah, that's brilliant. That's, that's what right. I do. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. and, and people say, oh, you've been, you, like you said, have you been in the army? No. Well, how come you know so much about it? Because I've got lots of friends who've been in the army and I mm-hmm. make it my business to search out people who are gamekeepers or bell rope manufacturers or oh. forensic <laughs> chemists you know and if you say hi um rather than me talking about myself could you talk to me about yourself and they go oh great mm-hmm. yeah yeah do you know you've you've just echoed what david baldacci um said in one of his master classes um uh that you know that that video thing you can get mm. um he said a, a very similar thing that you know you can always go and research it people like talking about themselves and some of the, you know some of them you might have to wait a little bit but um you can always find out stuff you know you can always talk to people and and that's such a good piece of advice I mean I know you're going to give us some more writing craft mm-hmm. tips in a bit but that's a that's a really good one for any beginner author listening to to, to, to yeah. you talk now to bear that in mind that you I shouldn't think, yeah shouldn't rem- ever forget that there's it, no, and, is, and, if, and if it's not real, then you can make it up. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, I mean, it, exactly. The, the job is, it's the job of the imagination 
people say, you know, blah, blah, blah. I say, well, I make it up. You know, it's what I do. Mm. Um, you know, it's a storybook. It's not a manual for anything. It's not a polemic. It's not supposed to be. I mean, we may get on to some, you know, whether, whether art reflects life and should, should we be saying, should we be writing these kind of characters? But at the end of the day, you know, I sort of feel that I'm, you know, purveying escapism and maybe on a deeper level without being too pretentious. You know, I think I'm saying something about what it's like to be human, um, which is in a way you could argue that the job of all fiction and, and drama back to the ancient Greeks and beyond. You know, we're trying to illuminate um, what it means to be human from our perspective mm -hmm. um, yeah so when um this sort of again you sort of partially answered this but you were talking earlier about we were talking about that issue of sort of reining in and and keeping focused but at the same time thinking ahead uh, about those mm. overarching arcs so that's one thing when you're dealing with one series what What's it like engineering a new series after you've written 12 books in another one? Is it hard to let go like of, of, of Gabriel? How do you get from Gabriel Wolf to, from Gabriel yeah. to Stella and, and then it's, start afresh with a completely new set of characters in a new environment? You know, it's a new world. It, it is. And, well, <laughs> it's a good question. Um, and it's, you know, it's gradual for me because, you know, I'd written quite a few of these Gabriel Wolf books and I just thought, because of the, I love crime. It's probably the genre I love reading the most. I want to write a crime thriller. I want to have a female lead. You know, I had quite a lot of things worked out. And I spent a long time, again, mostly on dog walks, trying to create Stella's world and create her backstory before mm. I bothered about stories and plots. So that by the time I came to the first, actually, it, it was always going to be a trilogy. And then I with a definite end. I mean, it's not a sport, you know, if, if actually probably is a spoiler, I shouldn't say this, but <laughs> I, I had this idea. It was going to be a three book story, the end. Mm -hmm. uh, but at any rate, it was something about what would, what would happen to a cop if they were, you know, if they lost their husband in a, in a hit run and, and it's a conspiracy and she starts digging into it. And that was all I had. But by the time I got to kind of writing the story, I'd already got it absolutely fixed in my head who she was, who her bag man was, who her boss was. Um, so you got and, to know her on a dog walk, basically. Yeah, oh, many, yeah. Many absolutely. dog walks, but that's, yeah, what yeah, you, yeah. that's what you got to know your character first and then you wrote about yes, her. Yes, and I think this is uh, this would be another one of my creative writing tips is you, you've, I think you have to start with a character or, mm -hmm. or because I don't like really telling people what to do. I have always started with a character and I think it's a not bad way to start a book, to start a novel, is to find somebody that you have some sort of emotional connection with, even though you're creating them. And they do, I know it sounds pretentious, but they do surprise you on occasion. Oh. And when you've got a character with something that they desperately, desperately need, then I think you're kind of at a position where you could think, well, how am I gonna flesh this out? You know, and then they need to start thinking about the story or the plot. And then there's a bit of back and forth. One of the great things I learned from Jack Butler, who's my editor, Thomas and Mercer, and he just left, <laughs> traitor, was um, <laughs> it's not just about what they want. I mean, uh, Kurt Vonnegut, you know, famously said that every character should want something, even if it's a glass of water. And people get that. Oh, yeah, I get that. Fine. But I've sort of used this in my teaching, which is fine. But what happens if they can't have the glass of water? In other words, what's at stake? And that's my little twist. That's my little contribution. What's at stake for the character if they don't get what they want? And I do an exercise where I get people to imagine a character, imagine a glass of water. They now find a way to stop them getting the glass of water. Right. And, and then you say, right, Brilliant. what are they going to do about it? And that reveals character. As in, not right. the character, but that's it's different between personality and character. Character is what happens when you put a, a challenge in front of somebody, and they have to behave in relation to that challenge. I mean, if it's a sort of invisible force field, what are they going to do? Are they just going to be passive? Are they going to break through it? If it's a waterfall, are they going to jump over? You know, if it's a dinosaur with a ray gun, you know, and yeah. without without there being any stakes, it's still not a very it's it's a tale if you like or it's a it's a plot but it's not a story I mean without getting too sort of exercise no, I, about which mm -hmm. is which I but like that absolutely makes sense because that that they, those are the books we've all probably picked up the, the ones that we're bored with because we're kind of like yeah and that was mm. that was predictable because the, the character wasn't challenged it just went from the journey went from a to b there was no yes. there was no there were no obstacles in the way and that that's 
I think that's a really useful mm. thing. Even as an editor, that's a really useful thing to understand, particularly if you're not a structural editor. I'm not a structural editor. Mm. It's, uh, it's really valuable to, to hear that. Mm. So we've all ca- always kind of sort of started in on the sort of, you know, the writing process here, um, Andy. Um, mm. And I think we'd all agree that, um, that that being an independent author really has never been easier, you know, because of all the digital tools available and yeah. self-publishing. But the craft of writing is, is it just still as hard. Um, uh-huh. So you've already um, mentioned um, a couple of tips there. Um, but is there is there anything else that you would want to talk about that a beginner author would do well to pay attention to? Um, yes, I think I think there is. And, you know, I, because I'm a broad brush kind of a person, I'm going to I'm going to start there because I think there are, as you know, because, um, you know, Louise, you're one of them fantastic stylist uh, aware editors who, you know, if you're a Jeffrey Archer type of person, shall we say, mm-hmm. not being mm-hmm. too rude about it, mm-hmm. you know, if you can't string a sentence together, but you can string a story together, that's not a problem. The problem's the other way around, which is, I think, the problem with a lot of literary fiction. Very good stylists, uh, have, they haven't uh-huh. got a storytelling bone in their body. Mm-hmm. So, my if I can, I'll give you two tips. The first tip is don't mistake a situation for a story. Um, by um, what I mean is you get that sort of what if exercise, you know, in creative writing institutes, what if, blah, blah, blah. And, and when people sort of, you begin a writer, so they'll have, the, oh, I've got a book of you. I know, what if reading was outlawed and, you know, punishable by death? Oh my God, that's amazing. And, you know, they, you can go a long way into a novel with that. You can build a world and you can think about the logo of the sort of fascist government that's outlawed reading and you can have names for the, you know, the commander of literary punishments. And then you see people on Twitter saying, oh man, I'm blocked. I've written 30,000 words of my work in progress and I'm blocked. And I was, and I, do you want to know why you're blocked? Because you haven't got a story. You've just mm. got a situation. Because when you say, what if it reading was outlawed? I'm like, okay, well, what if it were? Mm-hmm. And they're like, oh, uh, uh, well, uh, you know, if you read a book, you'd be killed. Okay, page two. <laughs> yeah, so I, yeah, my yeah. thing would be: let's say you've got um, a police chief who's responsible for enforcing like policy raids, policy rather, and he raids a secret library and has the librarian arrested, and then he, you know, all the troops go off the black clad people go off the library, and he's left alone in the library, and he picks up a book and and he opens it guiltily opens it and five hours later tears streaming down his face he puts the book down and he 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 has a change of heart he realizes he has to save the librarian from the firing squad and then it is how does he free her without ending up tied to a post himself and now i think we have a story which you know sort of archetypal terms you could call rescuing the maiden or whatever so what if reading was punishable by death and the person responsible for killing everyone who read became a reader. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. that yeah. is all so I would do with anyone. Level. It's just a level where you can, because then there's all sorts of hijinks and, and the, the setting falls by the wayside. You know, is it a love story? Maybe it's not. Maybe it's nothing to do with love. Maybe it's something else. Maybe it's about personal liberty or who knows. But uh, something you just introduced there, Andy. Sorry to interrupt, mm-hmm. but it, it, come, it, it harks back to something you said earlier, and that you 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 were at pains to say you were talking about character. As soon as you you turn the what if into a into a that that sort of trans transformation yeah. that yeah. happens, you're 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 it, you're as a reader, you're then you're invested. Mm-hmm. You're invested in a character, a person, and and yeah. that's 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 a much more interesting story because that's something we can get our teeth into as readers, rather than a than the, the, just a, a situation. Well, I think so. it's like the difference between us. I mean, I'm, you know, metaphors go all over the place. Like it, it, you don't want it to be two dimensional. It's just like a shadow show, like you mm-hmm. said. It just goes from A to B, mm-hmm. and and also I think it ties into what we were saying earlier about write what you know. Well, I know a lot about people. And it, the, that's been the sort of subject of inquiry of my entire life, you know, and it's what I'm fascinated by. And it could be on another planet. It, they could be, you know, bees. You know, I read that novel, The Bees, um, or Doctor Who or whatever. And the best of these stories doesn't matter about the setting. It's really about very human failings or human strengths like mm. sacrifice or greed or mm 
corruption or lust for power. And you, everybody knows people like that, or maybe they even recognize those characteristics in themselves. So when you have a sort of 93rd century space person um, cheating on their space boyfriend, yeah. the world building doesn't matter anymore because what yeah. we're talking about is faithlessness. And I think yeah. that yeah. is what I yeah. mean about explaining you, the way you feel people are to your reader and mm. uh, why I think you know that the whole hang up on sort of genre fiction versus literary fiction is is a sort of you know not worth to I mean, people do talk about it but it's not really worth talking about you know at its best I think the best literary fiction uh, sorry the best genre fiction is like the best literary fiction you know we just lose ourselves in yeah. this person that we identify with yeah. or engage with or can imagine or can relate to even if they're technically a bad person mm, yeah yeah no mm. i'm definitely with you there on the um entry literary fiction snobbery front mm. <laughs> <laughs> can i can i go back to something just thinking about your writing process here andy mm. that you mm. you mentioned earlier we, we, well we talked about um the the story arcs uh, both within the novel and then across a series of maybe a, a three books in your series so mm. you're thinking ahead and planning that but you described yourself as a pantser, didn't I know. you? <laughs> How, can, you explain, can you explain that one? <laughs> uh, well, um, yes, I, 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 it's evolved um, mm -hmm. because I've realised that, you know, w w for the first sort of three years, it was a sort of hobby. I mean, I was making money, mm -hmm. but I had a day job as well. And, so, and it was all indie. It was all self-publishing. So to a certain extent, I could please myself. So, you know, I could just start a book and kind of push on and it would, you know, it would get to where it was going. Um, when I started working with Thomas and Mercer, uh, you know, I, I published five works of nonfiction with, with um, traditional publishers. So I'm just going to use that relationship. But in, in fiction, it's quite different in that you're not an expert. I mean, I, when I wrote my copywriting books, I was just commissioned and I was the expert and they pretty much took what I delivered. Mm -hmm. the fiction is mm -hmm. saying, well, we need to see an outline or... I don't really get this thing. You know, why are these two murders happening? I don't see any connection between them. You know, if Ford was like this, then surely he'd be more like that. Can you do something about it? Um, and I realized that if I was going to take this on as a full-time job, I had to get a bit more professional about it. And it does. So, so where I've got to now is a sort of hybrid because what I do is sort of, I start off with a one sentence description. So like a classic Hollywood sort of um, log line. Mm -hmm. Can I, you know, so the, the one for Shallow Ground is, um, Detective Ford has a killer to catch, but can he escape his own dark secrets? Okay, so we, we've got this, and I can sum up the plot in sort of one sentence. Then I make it a paragraph. Then I go to a sort of, you know, I, I always like the metaphor of a, having a gun held to your head. People say, oh, I can't possibly explain what I do in 30 minutes. I say, well, how about if we had a gun to your head? I bet you could then, <laughs> yeah. Or, yeah. or 10 seconds. You'd manage, yeah. wouldn't you? Yeah. <laughs> so I, I sort of write a kind of treatment, you know, a two or three page treatment. Sounds like an outline to me, Andy. It sounds like an outline. <laughs> But, you know, I, I read, um, is it Kerry Wilkinson who writes the sort of uh, Jessica Daniel books? And I read uh, an interview with Kerry and he said he wrote like, you know, 36,000 word outlines. And I thought, well, that's like half a that's book. A book. <laughs> yes. yeah. And I thought, geez, you know, but because I am impatient, I start realizing what's going to happen. I really want to write it properly. So I have this sort of outline, not quite scene by scene, but kind of action by action point. Then I know what's going to happen. And I put it to one side and I kind of take a, you know, back up a few yards and then take a run and a jump and get into it. And, and if I feel I'm slightly lost, I look and it says, oh, now we should be doing this. Right. So you and, can rein yourself back in a little bit then maybe. A bit. So yeah. it's like, I guess you could say I'm kind of pantsing each chapter. Yeah. So you kind of know where novel. you need to get to roughly and you're, yeah. so you're pantsing the bits in between. Yeah. Exactly. And I think that kind of is the best of both worlds. Yeah. It's a hybrid, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. 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 And I suppose that's coming back to what you were saying earlier about your publishing commitments. Now it's become you surely it's a, essential that you're a bit more organized. <laughs> this is your job. Yes, it is. <laughs> and I mean, you know, it's a very interesting uh, switch because I still self publish two of the series, but you know, the, the thing with working with a, a publisher, as I said, which I've done before, is that you are now working with people who aren't employed by you. Uh, so, uh. you know, the Jack, Russell, the um, sort of dev editor, the copy editor, the proofreader, everyone, they're all employed by, ultimately, by Amazon. Yep. But, you know, Thomas and Mercer, not by me. 
Yeah. And although they're, they're the sweetest, kindest, the most generous bunch of people, I know that if I turn a piece of crap, they would tell me yeah. because yeah. they are going to have to go to their you know, investment committee or their acquisitions team or their director and say, I think this guy is worth investing in. So I, I feel it's, you know, it behooves me to turn in a decent first draft that's as close as possible to something that they want to publish. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, it's it's working. It's fine. It, it's going really well. And I, uh, that I think you you make those compromises if you want the security blanket of a big publisher behind you, and you accept their dollar and you sign their contract and you accept that their working methods are the working methods you should follow. Having said that, you know, on the last one, Jack said, no, 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 I'm fine. If you've you've got this idea of a dead soldier in the middle of a ghost village in on Salisbury Plain, I love that. Just just go with it. See where it takes you. So they've learned to trust you, though. I think that's yes. the thing. Is it's a collaboration, yeah, yeah, yeah. isn't it? It's like you've 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 kind of um you've delivered, and so yeah, yeah, and so yeah. now I mean, now there's a little bit more. Perhaps... There's a bit more trust. I mean, can we yeah. use? A, I think yeah. there there is a bit more trust. You know, and I've always. Um, you know, been at pains to, to either say explicitly or communicate the idea that, you know, I am going to be an easy author to work with. Mm. I'm not one of those prima donnas who's going to dig their heels in over every semicolon. And if you tell me it needs to be more like this, I'm going to make it more like that because, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you know, we could sell more books. Yeah. I could have more yeah. readers. Yeah. Yeah. You know, which Andy, seems Andy. to be important. Oh, sorry. Mm. No, beg mm. your pardon. Um, I was just saying this seems like a good idea. <laughs> well, no, no, no. Let me try one more time. It seems to me that we're all in this, you know, we, we both want the same thing. The more sales we get, the better everyone likes it. Yeah. Yeah. I'm so sorry. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, can I ask you how you came to get your um, uh, contract with Thomas and Mercer? You can. And it's a good story. And, and I feel it, it, it reflects well on, on me and them, actually, which is... I submitted book three in the Stella Cole series called Hit and Done to the Kindle Storyteller Awards 2018. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was very easy. You just put Kindle Storyteller Awards as one of your keywords when you're publishing the book on KDP, you know, the Kindle mm-hmm. Direct Publishing Platform. Mm-hmm. And I got a call from uh, one of the guys at Amazon who said, um, you've been shortlisted. Fantastic. Wow. Would you like to come along to the launch party? I'm like, Fuck me, try and keep me away. This is excellent. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I know, right? I mean, this is you know, <laughs> Would you like to? Like, no. <laughs> Would you like to come? You know, it's going to be Lorraine Kelly as the chairman of the judges. I'm doing, but mate, you know, I'm in. Yeah. So I, you know, turned up Best Bip and Tucker and then Champagne and Canapes, a proper big publishing launch. And there were five of us who we're all still really good friends, actually. We sort of on a WhatsApp group and we we met up for dinner you know once or twice so that within itself was really lovely to meet four other authors like that but although I didn't win in a way I did because when we afterwards you know when your nerves have gone I was talking to a lady you know I had a glass of champagne in my hand and said so who do I have to talk to at Amazon about getting a publishing deal and she said well my name's Laura Deacon I'm the publishing director you can talk to me if you like no. <laughs> like, Brilliant. right okay <laughs> so we had a chat and, and what what I mean about it reflecting so nicely on them is she was so generous with the time there was none of that sort of thing you get a networking thing so people looking over your shoulder the whole time to see if there's anyone yeah. they should be talking to you know she just was you know we just had a really nice chat and she said well you know I've got to go and talk to some other people I'm going to introduce you to Jane Snellgrove. She's one of my acquisitions editor. I think she'd be perfect for you to talk to, which she did like the day later. Jane and yeah. I had a conversation. Yeah. In the end, we decided or they decided and I agreed it, it wouldn't make sense for them to republish the Stella Cole books, which is what they often do. She said, but would you be interested in developing a, a new series with me? I'm like, uh, yeah, <laughs> you know, nah, you no, that actually doesn't oh, appeal. No, to be that, that doesn't work for me. I'll, I'll leave it. I'll leave it. You know, all best. So we, so we did, and I came with you know a bunch of different characters, a bunch of different ideas, and, and we settled on Inspector Ford, although he wasn't called that originally. Um, mm. If you'd like to, he had the most pretentious name ever for a fiction on, detective, Ajax Page. <laughs> it worked for me. What's, it, anyway, what's Ford's first name? Yes. What is his first name? It's a bit like Morse. Oh, is it uh, Morse? Oh, you don't, no, don't know. I know, I know, I know what it is. Uh, uh-huh. And it begins with the same letter, but it isn't Endeavour. It's not Endeavour. He's only ever known as Ford. He, his nickname in the station is Henry. Uh, 
Right, right. Um, but, and there's a yeah. lovely bit of play around nicknames because he's sort of, um, I would say partner in crime, and his sort of oppo is a sort of for deputy forensics head, Hannah Fellows, is on the Asperger spectrum. And she's got a big thing about nicknames. She loves nicknames. She gets one in book two. So the, the nickname, which I didn't really think about at the time, has come to be quite a little leitmotif in, in, in the books. Yeah. And there's a lot of stuff about truth telling and honesty, which I quite like. That, and he drives a discovery. And, and this is one of the things about, I think, you know, writers' brains. You, you never, I, I think the other day, I was like, that's amazing. You know, out of all the cars he could have drove, he's got a discovery. What a great car for a detective. Man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but yeah. you thought of it. Because <laughs> I thought he picked it. So, and it was a coincidence. So I love, you know, little things like that that just happen. Mm -hmm. and they that's what I mean about characters taking you by surprise you start yeah. thinking that I thought oh he chose a car and it turned out to have a really good name yeah um, yeah <laughs> so, so um, um, yeah that's how we got that deal going that, that's that's wonderful and again you just it just shows that it never hurts to ask does it because well that's what I was always taught by my mum and dad you know yeah. if you yeah. don't ask you don't get, you don't get. Yeah. yeah absolutely yeah so um just following on from um, a couple of conversations ago um, about writing craft and, and writing yeah. process, um, do you have any advice for beginner authors about who want to deepen their writing craft? Um, so courses, books. What are your top tools? What do you What do you What do you like for well, for, for, for not if for probably you know people people at the early stages to, so they can really sort yeah. of get, a, get a grip I, grip of mm, this craft? Do you know? I I think. Hmm. See, I spent, I'm, I'm sort of humming and hurrying because I spent such a long time as a copywriter being sort of, sort of almost like an engineer of the language about it. You know, I thought, you know, mm. if you go on copywriter Twitch, it's full of people snarking at other copywriters because they don't know how to spell. And, and <laughs> you know, a lot of the sort of creative writing books, I think, the, you know, like how to write a novel in, in three days or, you know, Dorothy or Brand, all these sort of writing manuals, they, they're sort of quite good, but I think that you can end up being paralyzed by anxiety because you've, you've got a book on description and a book on dialogue and a book on this and a book on mm. that. Um, I actually think the best thing to do is to read the kind of books you like, you would like to write, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. actually. I mean, yep. if you want to write great literary fiction, you know, the great British novel, uh, read those kind of things, you know, mm. or, or, you know, read Zadie Smith or read Irvine Welsh. It doesn't really matter if you want to read, if you want to write crime, it's what I know about, I'd say, well, read a, a ton of crime novels and you'll get a feel for mm. what they're like, but read everything. You know, Steve King says, you know, to be a writer, you have to write a lot and read a lot to which I would only add the thing that Dr. Johnson said, which is a fantastic quote, which is the mark of an amateur is someone who writes more than they read. Mm. <laughs> yeah. And I think what he meant was, you know, you have to study what's gone before, like art yeah. students in a, in a gallery copying yeah. old masters. Yeah. Um, if you copied out, you know, if you copied out Patricia Heisman, you know, amazing Mr. Ripley, whatever it's, I can't remember the exact title, but you know, the Ripley. Mm -hmm. If you copy one of those out, you've now written a Ripley novel. You didn't write it first, yeah. but you have mm -hmm. written every word of a best-selling international thriller. And, and, and you absorb some of the techniques and some of the necessary sort of craft skills through that process I'm not literally suggesting that's an idea but i think the best advice to a, a beginner writer is is buy a piece of paper or find a piece of paper and a pencil and sharpen it and apply the one to the other and mm -hmm. then you're a writer you may be a shit writer you may be a great yeah. writer but yeah. you can't be a writer if you're not writing and if you're reading yeah with all respect to everyone you know, you'll be you have to read mm -hmm. if you're reading you're not writing if you're not writing you're not a writer and and one of the sort of things that always pains me is people on social media you know like aspiring novelist and i what's yes. an aspiring i mean yeah, i'm yeah, an aspiring yeah. ferrari owner <laughs> yeah. oh so you've got a ferrari <laughs> no no i mean, no, believe me there are all sorts of things i can't even talk about that i aspire to be <laughs> yeah. Christina Hendricks is next husband. I'm aspiring to that. It's not going to happen. So I think, you know, that if you're a beginner writer listening to this and you've got an idea for a story, find yourself an hour, a piece of paper and a pencil and start writing that story. Or just start writing about the character. Just yeah. start next exercise. This is a story about a woman called Louise. And what Louise wanted more than anything else was a glass of water. And the best day in her life was when somebody brought her a glass of water. And it was the worst day in the 
world because then they tipped it down the drain of fund collapse. You know, um, now you're yeah. and before yeah. you know it, this story comes to life because you start off with a character and then give them a name and give them a pair of glasses and decide what kind. Do they wear them on a lorgnette or, you know, do they keep losing their glasses on the on top of the head? And you can get going quite a long way. And the more you get to know this character, I think, the, more, the closer you are to starting to tell their story rather than doing that sort of what if everyone got switched off when they were 30 years old. As yeah. I said, you know, yeah. okay, well, what if they did? Yeah, I mean, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Can I ask you a little question, given that you were talking about, like, getting to know and creating mm. your characters there? Do you do you like your characters? Do you think it's important to like your characters? Do you ever dislike any of your characters? I mean, strongly. Uh, I mean, I know, honest, I guess no. they're not perfect, but... No, um, I, I do... Do you think it's important to like them? I think it's important to care about them. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, I don't know if I'd like some of the characters. I mean, I guess my lead characters, you sort of you grow to like them. And I think it's an interesting question um, as they all have been, because one of the criticisms you sometimes see from reviewers, and it always makes you want to smack them, although I love you all reviewers, thank you for reading my books, <laughs> is when they say, uh, added. <laughs> not my books, you know, I see reviews of other books and they say, well, I did, none of the characters was likable. And we're always taught on, so, you know, highbrow creative writing, these, oh, these sort of lowbrow people who, who think characters have to be likable. And well, well, maybe they do that. I mean, what, but what Jane said to me, my original commissioning editor, was that they have to be relatable. And yeah. I think that's a much more useful word, yeah. actually. Mm-hmm. Can you relate to your characters? Because mm. think of Dexter. Mm, um, yeah, 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 yeah. The, the guy totally is, is a psychopath, in. right? He's, yeah. a, he's a psychopathic <laughs> serial killer. You yeah. root for him. You root for him, yeah, don't yeah. you? Yeah. Absolutely. Hannibal Lecter, one of the yeah. most ob- obnoxious. Well, is he, though? I mean, Anyway, we all know who Hannibal Lecter is. He's the hero of all those stories, or he's an classically he's an anti-hero. Yeah. But look at him, he's a gourmet cook. He loves reading, he's cultured. He can win professorships in an Italian art institute. Uh, he, he can't abide rudeness. Most of the people he kills, he kills because they're rude. Well, I mean, who wouldn't <laughs> like to kill people who push in front of them on the, in the queue? Yeah. So, I, you know, I think... You have to make them relate. But in fact, one very good criticism from a member of one of my sort of, you know, Facebook groups, he said, I just don't, you know, Stella is just very, um, she just exploits everyone. You know, there's no sort of, he, I think he did say, I don't like her, I just don't find her a likeable character. And I realised that in, in my uh, sort of identifying with this burning sort of vendetta-like mindset, I had forgotten to give her any humanity, which maybe she had lost. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. After what yeah. happened to her, but, but that's that, not the point. You know, yeah. you, the readers are saying, "Yeah, but give us something." Because the arc might be in your head for 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 that, but yeah, they don't you know. know. You exactly. you need to hint at it a little bit, yeah. maybe. Yeah. So I, I that was a good steer from him, and in, in the second oh. book, I did go out of my way to introduce um, a sister-in-law and a brother-in-law and a niece called Polly, who was sort of a bit of light relief, and you know, I did start to humanise her, and I think she's become a really great character and I've this particular guy got in touch and I really like what you've done with Stella now I think she's just you know she's there yeah oh that's nice that's nice lovely. to get that feedback isn't yeah, it yeah yeah so um so we've talked quite a lot there about the story and the process um so if we've got the interior story nailed a bad cover and blurb can still mm. stop a potential buyer in their tracks can't they oh so, yes what would your best advice be on cover design and creating a great blurb because I know people do struggle with the blurb don't they they do um should we do with the blurb first yeah, uh, yeah. I mean I I wrote all my own and then I've all I've quite recently rewritten them all and I think mm. it's one of the nice things about self-publishing um I I would um one of okay here's what not to do don't try and summarize your entire story yeah. in like 75 words you'll yeah. go you'll go mad and it doesn't <laughs> matter because what you know you're if think of it as an advert right think of it as an ad for your book like the amazon page and the back copy sorry the back cover copy so there's a there's a an old copywriting formula called aida which is attention interest desire action so i would say that the first thing is you get the reader's attention with a hook line or a headline so that means you know in bold type at the top of your amazon thing it says something like um the widow's a cop and she wants revenge. Ooh, 
Ooh, yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Widow. So we've yeah. got Widow, yeah. Cot, and Revenge. Or I had another one, Forget the Law, She Wants Revenge. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, okay, fine. So, so she's transgressing. So she's not just a cop, she's potentially a bad cop, but she's a widow. Huh. <laughs> so that's how you gain attention and it stops them flicking on. Then you want to provoke interest, so the second letter of Aida, by you dive into the lead character's dilemma. So you say, you know, uh, in this, I'll keep going with this thing because I more or less remember, you know, uh, Stella mm -hmm. Cole was a high-flying detective in the Met until one day a, a hit-and-run driver ripped her family in two. <gasps> oh no, that's yeah. how awful. And yeah. after years of compassionate leave, uh, you know, she comes back and starts re-investigating her husband's death. So this is where you, the D in Aida is desire. You stimulate desire by fleshing out the story with hints at the style of narrative and the sort of, you know, explosive action, maybe even a couple of reviews. So I had to see, you know, that classic sort of slightly overwrought style where, you know, she discovers, you know, what she discovers um, shakes her faith in the law and, and almost loses her sanity. Mm -hmm. So it's this high level conspiracy. And then you have a couple of things, you know, an amazing book. I, I couldn't put it down. Jeff Smith, you know, Maidenhead or whatever. And then the, the call to action, which all advertising copywriters ought to know about. So in Aida, the second A is action. Is I would just have a line that says, download your copy now. Because uh -huh. what you do with any piece of copy, and that's what the blurb is, it's an ad copy, is you have to decide what it's for what it's there, what it's trying to do. And the, the exercise I set my students is visualize your reader finishing reading what you've just written. What do they do next? What can you see them doing next? And after a little bit of, you know, to and fro, this person will say, well, I want them to click the download button. I say, right, put that, that's your call to action. Yeah. Yeah. Click the download button now to get your copy of Hit and Run on your Kindle. And there is that thing, isn't it? If you want somebody to do something, why tell not just tell it. them? Tell them to do it. They're much more likely to rather than yeah. just like, mm -hmm. you know. And then you get this sort of mindset thing, which I totally understand. A lot of creative folk, particularly, I think, you know, writery creative folk, they say, oh, well, you know, I don't really like selling. I say, well, <laughs> okay, fine. Yeah. I say, Let me ask you a question. Have you got anybody else selling for you? Not really. <laughs> Say, so, would well, you want to sell some books? Yeah. And put okay, a call so, to action in. <laughs> mm, put a call to action in. They said, well, I don't like blowing my own trumpet. And I said, well, nobody else is blowing it. It's you so know? true. It's yeah. so true. If you don't true. toot your own horn, who else? I mean, actually, you can get people to do it. And I have a fantastic lady in the States called Margaret Daly, who is blowing my own trumpet for me over there because she's an expert in US marketing. Mm. Yeah. But, you know, that's a, that is one of the, there are only three ways to sell books. You have a publisher, you have an agent, as in a marketing agent, not a literary agent. You have a publisher, you have a marketeer who you pay or you do it yourself. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you've just uploaded a book to, you know, yeah. it'll really just, yeah, a yeah. Book it'll just vanish, games. won't it? Vanish. Yeah, yeah. And they've got, what, I don't know, 20 million books on the Amazon oh, yeah. Yeah. store yeah. right now, 30 million. People at Amazon don't even know, there are so many. Mm -hmm. um, and it, yeah. is, it, it has to be one of the biggest weaknesses for, for many um, writers is that you know they, they don't think about that aspect of writing their book they're so invested in pouring every ounce of their energy into a book and but then it's finished and they haven't even thought about how they're actually going to get it out there mm. and how they're going to convey it, you know th their message um oh. in in their blur it is that difference isn't it between being a writer and being a publisher yeah well, I think, especially you know, when you're doing it yourself yeah, louise you've just you've just nailed it and i think so that the indie publishing is just a fantastic uh disruptive technology yeah. and disruptive mm -hmm. you know the, you know god love them but i mean traditional publishers are just oh, what the fuck do we do now mm -hmm. but i don't think they need to worry too much because for me if you take that phrase self-publishing that most writers, most indie writers concentrate on the first word. They're very focused on self. I'm doing it myself. It's all for me. And they're not really focused on the second word, which is by far the most important word, which is publishing. Yeah. And mm -hmm. you say, well, what does a publisher do? Well, they, they edit it. They pay for you know, copy editors, line editors, cold reads, audiobook narrators, proofreaders, cover designers, salespeople, marketing, rights, PR, you know, the works, Everything, yeah. author relations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, you're getting 100% of the, the revenues, but you that means you have to do 100% of the work. And, it, you know, I think it's, you know, it kind of where people say, outrageous, you know, I've just had a, an offer from so-and-so, and I'm only getting 10%. I said, but you're only doing 10% of the work, darling. I mean, I know you've written 100% of the book. Yeah. 
but you know th- th- there's and they're not probably a... paying for the editing you know whereas know. um you know when you're when you go alone you you yeah. have to you have to you have to you all the costs are yours as well well I, yeah and you have to own that and you you know if you want to be self-downloadable if you want to be a self-uploader fine that's easy you can do that in about five minutes after you've finished after you've saved your word document you can basically have it online about five maybe could take as many as 10 minutes later mm-hmm. with the cover creator widget um, and it will be a piece of meretricious crap and nobody will ever buy it probably even your relations won't buy it <laughs> or you can invest mm-hmm. as much money as a publisher would mm-hmm. yeah and then you you know it's all down to you and th- this is it you know there are no shortcuts I mean I use the same kind of people that Thomas and Mercer use they're, they're yeah. freelance editors like like you are you know yeah you, you can't you know, if it's cheap, it's probably not very good. And if you're doing it, it's almost bound to be not very good. You know, I was advising somebody the other day not to do their own cover design. She said, yeah, but I am a good artist. It doesn't matter. Yeah, it just doesn't. Yeah. I've really got an idea for the image and I'm great at drawing. And I'm like, oh, well, fine. OK, you're not paying me for this advice. I go, go for it. <laughs> yeah. I just that, do it myself. That's the thing. Like, you might be a great artist, but there's a difference between being able to draw something and be able to create a really eye-catching compelling purchase inducing cover absolutely yeah because they're different things your covers are lovely andy well thank you i mean <laughs> i um, i'm actually redoing one whole series at the moment um giving them a sort of a, a refresh but you know we talked about um cover design which is it's the second half of this equation you know, the blurb is one part of the ad uh and and the cover is the other um Shall I, shall I tell you some of you give you some of my sort of ideas on please on, definitely so, yeah. so um number one i would always say let's just say you're writing genre uh, fiction if it, because there's a big super strategic tip if you're not writing genre fiction i wouldn't really bother with kindle i mean you, it's just not it's not set up for that you know one great book uh you know you will struggle you can do it but you'll struggle mm-hmm. to make money so let's say you're writing crime well what are the genre conventions what's happening in crime at the moment and stick with those they're there for a reason you might say oh god but everybody's doing it. i'm going to do something completely different mm-hmm. say, okay mm-hmm. fine which means that all of your readers will see everyone else's crime books they go oh a crime book and then they can look at yours and they're going yeah. i don't know what that is but as i like crime i'll ignore it and go for one of these crime books yeah. or if you're writing you know romance you know summer romance it's probably got pink swirly writing or there's a sort of you know lots of psychological thrillers there's usually a little child's shoe on the pavement or yellow and red are quite sort <laughs> yeah, of you know yeah, yeah, trope yeah, colors uh they're there for a reason mm-hmm. so stick with the genre conventions or bend them a little bit you know twist them a bit um, the other big thing i would say is look at them at thumbnail size you know reduce mm. them down because you know, I've been working with designers since I was 24, a long time. And designers always have the biggest screens and the best, you know, tech. And they'll present with proofs and it'll be like, you know, two foot by one foot tall. You know, oh, my God, that is absolutely beautiful. Look at the little money spiders between her eyelashes. That is and they, they spell my name. That is just genius. <laughs> we'll have that. And they go, oh, great. Fantastic. And then you shrink it down onto Amazon. What the fuck is that? It's just like this yeah. sort of mud. Yeah. Andy, that's but, an amazing tip. I had <laughs> never even thought of that, but it's so true. People can, you sit there on your iPad mm. and you can scroll and you can go boom, boom, boom in seconds. Yeah. yeah so yeah. It, it has to be, there has to be something that's, that works at that, at that mm. level. And, and that comes back to that point you made about sort of being able to identify the genre. Um, Which as I think, you're, yeah. you're flicking. Yeah, I was at a, um, a conference a couple of years back and there was a, one of the talks was on self-publishing and mm. cover design was touched on. And the publisher there related the story of somebody who had done that exact thing that you advise against, uh, Andy, mm. and had insisted on creating their own design that was different and um, stood out not in a good way compared to everything else that was in the genre. And they couldn't understand why their sales were poor. And eventually they were persuaded to go with a, a more conventional design, if you like, that, that fitted in with the tropes of that particular genre. Mm. And their sales went up something like 600%. In oh, my goodness. Yeah, it was, wow. it was unbelievable yeah. because it, it, 
people were just, as you said, they were just passing over it completely. Mm. Uh, which is, you know, people say, oh, no, you shouldn't judge a book by its cover, but people do, you know, they, yeah, no, they have expectations. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. I mean, and that, that sort of story doesn't surprise me. And you, you think of all sorts of, you know, if you look at, I mean, it helps, I guess, that I've had a career in marketing, but you look at packaging generally, mm. uh, look, look at gin packaging at the moment. There are certain... I mean, although there are like a, a trillion different bottles of sort of, you know, designer sort of artisanal gin at the moment, they all basically are, you know, playing a tune on the same basic idea. And whereas rum is all completely different. You mm -hmm. know, rum has sort of much more primary colours and is some busty mm -hmm. girl in a sort of naval, a Matalos outfit, you know, or whatever. Mm -hmm. Whiskey will be something different. If you package up gin like rum, nobody's going to buy it. Rum buyers will go, oh, gin, yuck. Gin yeah. buyers won't even notice it because... Unlike you and your marketing team who have spent like nine hours obsessing over this cover and you've shown it to your family and you've shown it to your babysitter and your hairdryer, what do you think? Which do you like, the yellow one or the blue? Oh, I think the yellow one's much better. I, I think, you know, I'll make up a, a statistic. I should think the average reader spends about 15 milliseconds looking at the cover of, of a book. Mm. And yeah. not even a big size. They've got that little strip of also boughts, you know, along the bottom of your yeah. search. Yeah. Or wherever it's coming out and going to, hmm. Oh, that looks interesting. Basically, oh, that looks like the last book I read that I enjoyed. That looks like Jack Reacher. Yeah. That's all you need it to do. Yeah. As long as I think, oh, yeah, but it's not Jack Reacher. It doesn't matter. It's not. All it's there to do is to stop them scrolling past your book. Your blur. It it's the visual it? version of that A. In, in, it is. It is. Absolutely. In, in it's A. attention. Yeah. Get Grab mm -hmm. attention. Yeah. Also, I mean, I can say, you know, try and avoid sludgy colours. You know, mm -hmm. use what I would call high chroma colours, you know, bright blues, bright oranges, bright yellows, bright reds, because they catch the eye. Uh, we are, you know, from sort of evolutionary biology, our brains are attuned to things that are basically what's called high salience. In other words, if you imagine a sort of a forest and it's all green, green stuff isn't dangerous to human beings. Green stuff isn't going to eat us. We don't really eat it. <laughs> we can't have sex with it to make more of us. <laughs> Things that are bright orange or stripy black and orange or red will probably bite us, sting yeah. us, eat us or kill us. So we, 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 <laughs> our brains are evolved to notice bright coloured things. And on that bombshell, any <laughs> listeners. <laughs> How's that for an ending? I tell you, no, do you know what? I've got one more question for go you. Go on. Go and I've it. got a question after that as well. Oh, excellent. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm here all night. Um, uh, can, we, can I ask you about audiobooks? How important is it for you to have audio versions of your books available? And do you narrate them yourself or work with a voice artist? Uh, it's, it's very important to me to have them, but I don't really know why. I don't make a huge amount of money from audiobooks, although I'm hoping that I will over time. You know, they, they, mm -hmm. they earn out their fees and then they, they, you know, they start making more profit. But I, I feel that, you know, because I think of myself as a storyteller, you know, I get a lot of emails from people saying and, and comments on my Facebook group, you know, when are you going to, when's the audio book available? And I think, well, you know, it's a bit kind of stick in the mud. So, well, I'm not going to do them because they, they're too expensive. It's like, I feel I have a sort of responsibility if I yeah. put my name out there. So that I tell stories that you like and they say, great, can I have it on my, you know, on my iPhone? I think you should say yes. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I'd love yeah. to do a graphic novel come to that. And I have a friend who does them, you know, illustrates them, but that's probably going out of my age group. So it's very important to me, kind of because I think it's part of the job. Mm -hmm. And I don't, I did think about narrating them myself. Uh, and I even did a, not a screen test, whatever the audio equivalent is, mm. put it on my Facebook group. And the comments were very sweet, but it's like, you know, <laughs> stick to the day job yeah, yeah. so really? i work with oh yeah so i've worked with a few three really great voice artists and what they do is completely not what i can do and i have no real desire to do it the, the only thing I, I feel sorry is is um helen moore who ed who narrates stella cole who is borderline psychopathic with grief and has done some very bad things to some even worse people. Stella, Hel not Helen. Stella does, but she she started calling herself Hell Stell on her text to me. So, and I hear this voice on my voice, like, fucking hell, it's Stella. And she has to sort of go and have a lie down, I think, after some of the more sort of, uh, you know, vibrant scenes in the book. Really? She said, oh, yeah, and that's, yeah. Andy, that was, that was all a bit much. You know, I've got to, you know, kind of sort of recover. But no, they're, they're fantastic people. And I, yeah. that, again, my advice is always, you know, unless you're a professional in this particular thing and possibly even then don't do it yourself hire a professional you wouldn't do your own brain surgery i hope 
you wouldn't do your own i certainly wouldn't do my own plumbing i did try it once and managed to bang five nails into a hot water pipe on the basis that well the first one was really hard so i think i better hit it harder <laughs> now i know how hard to hit it i'll do the other four the same way and this plumber was just like he's like he's just rolling his eyes and said did you not stop after one and i said well no because i thought i got the hang of it after one <laughs> and you just for the if anyone's interested you it's very difficult to block off a pipe with boiling water coming out of it with your thumb <laughs> I, do you know what I want to say to you? Like that—that's kind of so stating the belief and obvious that I don't know even how you got in that situation. I'm a and man, then, as I was how. gonna, well, but listen, I—I <laughs> I didn't. I did a sort of similar thing in that I kind of decided to repair the oh, tap on my shower and could, didn't know how to turn the water off because the stopcock was hidden and ended mm. up um, unscrewing the hot tap where with all the water oh, burning nice out of one. me and just having to sort of, like, a bit like you with the thumb, I had, I was sort what of covered you put in, in towels. Yeah, yeah, I use towels myself. as well. Yeah, yeah. so I, I kind of get how, you know, there's that belief for it in the moment that I can be a plumber. It, oh, can't, yeah, self, it can't be self rocket belief. science, can it? <laughs> No, it and you out. can you it is, it is rocket science. You can kind of pull it back to publishing by saying it's the, it's basically the same. You know, you yeah. will have the the literary experience of being squirted with boiling water yeah. if you try and design your own book cover. Yeah, and it will cost you more in the end because eventually, mm -hmm. when you've you've you know not had any income from your books, you will pay somebody you know mm -hmm. a modest sum of money, four hundred pounds maybe, five hundred pounds. Yeah. Or, or less if you're prepared to go to Serbia or, you know, Mozambique, where people hang out and do this kind of stuff, you will have something that looks as good as the next, you know, mm -hmm. whoever. Yeah. Jodie yeah. Pickles, and you can have a professional looking book. <laughs> Andy, I'm going to ask you my bonus question yeah. here, if I may. Um, so we've, we've mentioned Jack Reacher a couple of times, mm. and it made me think of... Um, when he made an appearance in a Stephen King novel. Now, did, do you know about that? Which one is that? Because I'm he's such under, a fan of Stephen King. Yeah, he's in Under the Dome. When they're, oh, when, when they're in the dome and they're... I haven't read that. I haven't oh, read that yeah. one. Well, oh, spoiler alert. <laughs> Sometimes it's a spoiler in the middle, not at the yeah, end. It's not right at the end, but they do decide that they, they, they need somebody to come in and solve a problem. Yeah. And they decide to get Jack Reacher in. And, oh. I, was, and I was reading them and I was like, the the actual Jack Reacher and it was that's so, very metatextual, isn't it? It is. So it made me think, wh who would you like to do that sort of cross narrative with? Who would you like your character oh. to appear oh. in? That's a tough one to throw. Well, to be, at him. Uh, one it? of my one of my characters borrowed it to be or, in Yeah, where else's. would you like like Gabriel oh, Ford Lordy. to turn up somewhere? Gosh, that's a really good one. <laughs> well, I think, yeah, it would have to be, where would it have to be? So would would Gabriel and Stella ever meet? Do you yeah. know, they have, they have, and people love it. That I've done a crossover story right. um, where it was Ivory Nation, which came out in January, about a sort of, I thought, what if there was a, you know, Justin Trudeau, I thought, imagine a cross between Justin Trudeau and uh, one of these sorts of uh, extreme right, but very charismatic, sort of European, populists mm -hmm. as sort of the guy in Austria mm. there'd be various of them and I imagine it's sort of super charismatic ultra left politician who um makes in a sort of Blairite type thing of the people's princess essentially takes power at the ele at the ballot box mm -hmm. uh and just then it all goes to shit and he's involved in all sorts of global corruption and Stella comes in to help him out because increasingly because I've got more and more interest in crime and less and less in the whole special forces thing more of his adventures have been sort of quasi sort of legal if you like in the sense yeah. that there needs to be police involvement and, and, and you know they'd met somewhere else and it just brought her back in and it just seemed and he'd been in one of her books as a sort of mopper up right at the end and people love it you know yeah, and I yeah, thought will, will yeah. I go for this or are you sort of breaking the law but my, my kids you know who are 16 and 18 they all talk about things you know the Marvel Cinematic Universe or the DC Universe yeah. this idea of a universe is something that people I mean my readers are kind of older than the sort of Marvel type uh, typical they're sort of in the you know 50s and upwards for the most part um, but they totally love it you know and they, and they kind of get it um, Ford I think is a standalone he he just exists in mm -hmm. Salisbury in his own world but He's a much more realistic character. Stella and Gabriel are kind of wish fulfillment characters, if you know what I mean. They, they do the things that we would love to be able to do, uh, but never could. Whereas Ford, 
pretty much you know is a police officer and he he, he sticks to the law mm -hmm. but those two yeah but I, I'd have to think about that actually where would I like them to appear I could say I could say Rankin's Edinburgh that would be a real feather in the cap I guess yeah oh, yeah. yeah why not you don't ask you don't get Andy. Well, did you know right. yeah, I could try couldn't <laughs> you I could no harm yeah <laughs> Andy um our time's just about up and I, I really have to thank you so much for sharing so Absolutely. much valuable information oh, it's been a pleasure great. yeah it's been a lot um, where can people get in touch with you to find out more about your books I would say very quickly andymaslin.com is my mm -hmm. website I'm on twitter at andy underscore maslin and I have a facebook group uh, called the wolf pack which is obviously oh. free to join uh, we've got about 3,000 members. Fantastic people, actually. Uh, always, you know, up for chatting. Um, if you Google me, basically, I'm all over the internet. So you you would find me. Great. Thank you, Andy. Uh, and Thank just you. To echo what De Denise said, it's 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 been such an absolutely packed with really, really great stories, but also actionable of actionable advice that I think oh, authors you. can take away and learn from you. Thank you for that. My pleasure. So that's it for this week. We hope you've enjoyed this episode as much as we have. You can rate, review and subscribe to us via Apple Podcasts, Spotify or whichever platform you prefer. Yep. Thank you so much for listening to the Editing Podcast. She's been Louise. She's been Denise. And he's been Andy. Join us again soon. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.